Okay, so good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Sharif Awads, consultant bariatric surgeon from Royal Derby Hospital, Derby in the UK, and also educational lead uh, for BOMS. So welcome again to November's uh, educational webinar. It's, uh, I'm, I'm really, really excited about the program for this evening. Um, thank you to Novo for sponsoring the talk tonight. As always, the session is going to be recorded and we'll make it available uh, on the YouTube channel uh, for those who couldn't join us. Um, please post your questions via the Q&A button down at the uh, bottom right hand side of your screen. Uh, a reminder of our next two events. So we have uh, the next journal club on the 8th of December, and this will be by the Bariatric MDT in Aberdeen, followed by the final educational webinar of this year on the 22nd of December. So Mary O'Kane uh, will be giving us a, a really, really important talk um, on nutritional aspects, supplementation, and some of the deficiencies and clinical manifestations that can occur. So please join us for that. Now, um, it's um, really, really privileged to introduce our speaker for tonight. So it's Huchta Gislassen, uh, who, in my opinion, is in the top three bariatric surgeons in the whole world. Uh, and I don't say that lightly. Uh, so my team in Derby had the privilege and honor of visiting Huchta's unit uh, when he was working in Alaris in Norway uh, some seven years ago now. And we learned an absolute huge amount. And I think Huchta's expertise in theater efficiency and setting up a high volume fast track bariatric program is the, amongst one of the best that I've personally seen. Uh, and I've certainly tried to emulate a lot of what I learned uh, from his team and the program. Um, the, uh, his team have done up to date around 18,000 bariatric surgeries. He now works in Sweden and I'm sure he'll share with us part of his journey. And he is a high volume, low complications, high efficiency surgeon. Um, and so his team does around 1600 cases a year. And these are proper bariatric procedures, not uh, BMI 30s, 35s. These are all comers, all sorts of comorbidities. Uh, and the show is run in one theater. So it's not five or six theaters side by side and the surgeon goes from one theater to another. Uh, and it is just mind boggling. If you have the opportunity to visit his unit, I would highly, highly recommend it. So that's enough from me. Um, this is definitely one of my top webinars uh, that I've arranged for this year. So Huchte, thank you very, very much uh, for coming on and speaking to us tonight and sharing your experience and we look forward to learning from you. Now, if you can just share your screen and then uh, you can get started with your webinar. It's okay. Sheriff, thank you for kind words. Um, first, I want to thank uh, the, the organization for inviting me to this webinar. My name is Jörtur Gislason, and uh, my task is to talk about fast-track bariatric surgery with focus on high volume, low cost, good quality, and teaching and training aspects. I have no disclosure myself, but uh, BOMS has uh, Thanks to no Novo Nordisk. I started uh, laparoscopic gastric bypass surgery in Iceland in year 2000. And that's where I uh, had my learning curves. Uh, in the beginning, I was not allowed to start surgery unless there was a free space at the intensive care unit. And we had all the precaution by uh, using nasogastric tube until the next day, using drains, urine catheter, and a lot of other uh, tools. And we had leakage test the day after and the patient stayed for, at the hospital for three or four days. In year uh, 2005, I started uh, a, pro a program in a private hospital in Oslo that soon became a pretty busy place. And uh, we, have, we implemented the fast track program in Oslo. And, uh, we have been able to transfer this program to other places uh, like in Denmark, Aarhus and Copenhagen and in Kristianstad, Sweden. In the beginning, we uh, worked for different uh, companies, uh, 
uh, owned by physicians, but uh, our latest uh, concern have uh, bought all these places. So uh, by the time I worked only for Aleris. Uh, in 2019, uh, the, we, we did uh, build our own company in Sweden and stopped cooperating with Aleris because of the differences, differences in ideolo ideology. So now I work for GP Obesitas that is owned by physicians working in this area. Our main uh, hospital is uh, we, we hire a ward and uh, operating theater in Christians, the hospital in Sweden. And we have an agreement with the region uh, in South Sweden, Skåne, to do about 700 cases a year at least. And we also take care of all the complication treatment in South Sweden. We have also started a private clinic in uh, Malmö, and uh, already this year we have uh, we are up to 600 cases, and we calculate that we will be about 1,500 in this private clinic uh, after a year. And we also have a clinic in Gothenburg uh, just started that Tostan Olpes have joined our team, and uh, this uh, it was his working place. So this is GPOBistas Skåne, and this is our website, GPOBistas. It is a website in different languages. Our main, uh, our main focus is multidisciplinary treatment. So there are a lot of uh, staff. We have 50 individuals working in our company, and uh, we have to take care of multicultural population. Um, so we have found out that uh, it is important to have doctor, nurses and dietitians speaking Arabic in order to give them uh, good care, both, both before and after surgery. I have a surgical team of uh, six regular surgeons and uh, some surgeons in part-time work. Uh, we have an outpatient clinic with uh, one gastroenterologist and one endocrinologist uh, working every other week. We have uh, three dietitians and three nurses at each clinic. And we have a complete staff for surgery, ward and recovery in Malmö and Kristianstad. And we think it's a key issue that our recovery is at the ward. It's one of the rooms at the ward that is the recovery room. So how do we get the patient? We uh, have agreement with Region Skåne at least 700 cases a year. And we have a transfer to, from uh, many other regions in Sweden as well, uh, mostly uh, complication patients or, or uh, most of this, this patient have a high comorbidity. And we have also started a clinic with a private patient and we are starting to uh, on the internet or advise in the internet. But many of the, the patients come in from Scandinavia because of the, we are known in, in this area. Uh, well, um, for the regional patient and uh, as, as well as the private patient, the price for each patient uh, is, is uh, 6,200 pounds. And that includes the preoperative work, follow up and, and follow up a complication for one year. Some of these patients uh, pay extra for. Um, uh, additional four years follow up. So uh, the fast track system is a big gap between uh, theory and praxis. So how do we do? Well, our basic philosophy is uh, a big preoperative uh, effort so that we have a well informed, well educated patient before surgery. So they are motivated and they have already started the trip. And that is the key issue in order to do a good fast track and keep have a good errors protocol. So then uh, the, the later it will become easier. Well, how we succeed, we, we have a focus on a very predefined clinical pathways and logistic. And that is important to improve outcome and uh, keep the cost low. We are doing uh, the same procedure all the time with standardized surgery, standardized anesthesia. We optimize the organization and this is a dedicated unit. We are not doing anything else than treating the bariatric patients. Uh, Preoperative preparation is usually one day of the clinic 
where information is very important uh, and uh, the patient are informed both of uh, uh, of the from the, uh, of a physician uh, nurses dietitian and uh, sometimes we have a psychologist there as well so we the game uh, the goal is to have a very well motivated patient that, that has already started the trip uh, for the re, uh, patient from the region uh, they should lose at least five percent of the body weight before surgery so they are in optimal shape when we do the surgery In preoperative evaluation by the physician, we uh, discuss with the patient uh, the different surgical procedure and talk about the anatomy. And uh, we discuss with, in individual with each patient what is the best surgery for you. And uh, it's important that the patient understand what we have done and uh, understand how the surgery works. It's no quick fix because if you don't use the tool uh, correctly, you probably will regain weight. So we talk about uh, what uh, what is uh, to be expected uh, uh, in the different areas. Uh, the dietitian and nurse talk about uh, the life after surgery. You have to eat small regular meals, not drinking fluid with a meal, drinking fluid between meals. And we stress that uh, obesity is a chronic disease and by doing a surgery, we often uh, create another chronic uh, problem that is uh, the vitamin that the patient need to take vitamins and mineral, minerals the rest of their life and take a, a blood example every year for the rest of their life. We stress the uh, importance of exercise, especially the first year when they're losing weight rapidly. Well, uh, in this slide, um, it, it, much of what we do is uh, to break down barriers. There are not a lot of barriers in our system. Uh, we have a, especially a hygiene rules that have been there for many decades, completely non-evident based, uh, probably done for uh, open surgery in old times. The, these uh, rules have uh, no value for uh, laparoscopic uh, surgery today. There are a lot of barriers, hospital barriers. This is not allowed because of. And there are a lot of professional barriers as well. Uh, this is my table, don't touch this. And uh, there are a lot of useless examination uh, done. So I will address this issue later. But uh, there are, in order to, to do an efficient program, you have to uh, use your head and uh, do what is sensible to do. So, for example, in laparoscopic surgery, we don't have to clean the operating theater between surgery. We clean it in the end of the day. We just uh, clean the table and take what uh, falls on the floor. Otherwise, it's not necessary. We don't have infection. Uh, well, we, if we have infection, it is usually related to leak. We take out uh, the routine that make no sense. I will address that in the next slides. Um, we are so fortunate in the Nordic, uh, in the Nordics that we, uh, the Nordic healthcare system is not regulated by insurance and insurance company and lawyers. We don't have to do a lot of unnecessary tasks just to cover our ass, if we can put it that way. With a preoperative workup, uh, work we, uh, we don't do gastroscopy routinely, only on clinical indication, rarely uh, because of some uh, complaints in the patient, but uh, it's mostly uh, in a revisional surgery that we do a gastroscopy. Uh, sleep apnea, apnea examination as well, it is un completely unnecessary. We see if the patient has a sleep apnea, they take the CPAP with them to, uh, to, to surgery. Many patients are not able to use the CPAP and we operate them anyway. So by the time we have, uh, well, um, if the patient is oxygenating poorly, we keep him uh, longer, for longer time at the uh, recovery room in the telemetry. Sometimes we have to have them over, over the night in telemetry, but it's just rarely. 
once every second year we may have to put the patient acutely on CPAP, but we don't see sleep apnea examination as a necessary thing. EKG is uh, done if a patient has heart, heart condition, metabolic syndrome or hypertension, otherwise we don't do it. If the patient has a ischemic heart disease, we often have a pre-operative evalu evaluation of the cardiologist. Psychiatric evaluation is usually unnecessary. Of course, we don't operate patient in an unstable psychiatric condition. And if the patient have a history of uh, severe psychiatric illness, we uh, establish before surgery contact with the uh, psychiatrist or psychologist and have a uh, and secure a tight follow in the weeks and months to come. Blood test is done as uh, we do it as if so recommend. Uh, one, uh, one blood test that we think is, uh, is very useful is uh, PET. It measures the average amount of uh, ethanol uh, taken in the last uh, eight to 10 weeks. And uh, it is not, uh, not uh, we, sometimes we see a patient with al active alcoholism that don't realize it themselves. So we think that this elevated PET is a contraindication for surgery and they have to take uh, and uh, deliver negative PET test after three months and six months before we accept them to surgery. So they have to work with the problem. With anticoagulation, we uh, start anticoagulation the day after surgery because of a fast track protocol, patients are very well and fit soon after surgery, up and going and drinking. In the beginning, we started, did give the uh, low molecular heparin the night before surgery, but we found out that we have more bleeding and more complication due to the treatment. So now it is start, we start the low molecular heparin the day after surgery. If they have a risk factor, uh, we, they start the evening before. And um, if they are on anticoagulation uh, therapy, uh, they stop their medication one, one week before surgery and start with low molecular heparin the day after, and they take uh, this low molecular heparin for 10 days before they start their medication again. Uh, if the patient has a serious medical condition, we uh, not rarely uh, have a patient waiting for a uh, kidney transplant or patient with uh, dilated cardiomyopathy. And then we do uh, surgery in close cooperation with the, in, with the treating units. Our case mix uh, in, uh, is a little bit different if it's a private or state patient. Uh, the, our private patient have an average BMI about 46 and private patient average BMI about 42. Uh, our main procedure is gastric bypass. Then we do sleep and uh, about 15% uh, revisional surgery and complication surgery and 5% SASI. Uh, the private patient, the, the sleeve is 35% uh, of the cases. Only brief for the surgery, uh, gastric bypass is our main procedure and the gastric bypass is preferred with higher BMI, with a metabolic syndrome and reflux. Sleeve uh, is uh, advised, we advise sleeve with a low BMI and uh, EBS, on, or psychiatric and personality disorder with a low BMI. And uh, SASI, we are starting a randomized uh, trial uh, comparing SASI and uh, gastric bypass in super obesity. And we think this is a very good procedure. We have done about 350 cases and it's a very good procedure maybe uh, this will be uh, the primary procedure in super obesity in the future. I believe that. It is much easier to do than distal gastric bypass, uh, technically easy, and we have a less, much lesser nutritional problem there. And the weight loss seems to be approximately as a gastric bypass. This is just about our fast track protocol. This, we have used a minimal invasive technique, of course, laparoscopic surgery with experienced team. And we have also standardized anesthesia and uh, 
all the task in the procedure is standardized. Uh, we have a uh, advanced uh, errors protocol and we cut all unnecessary intervention like urine catheter, gastro, gastric tube, arterial cannula. Very rarely use these things. So how the days go on, uh, usually we have a 28 patient in a single operating theater for one week and we operate eight patients Monday, Tuesday and Wednesday, Thursday, we operate seven patients. And we start usually at 7.30 and they're usually finished about three o'clock. Uh, we have a responsibility for training of young surgeon in uh, the region and uh, we will uh, we try to reduce the learning curve by by time. So I will go in that in detail later in the lecture. What we think is important working tool is time registration and longitudinal database. We don't this is, we are not stressed while working, but we work smarter and faster. And um, we very rarely use uh, loose employer. The, the, that our employer uh, seems to like working in our team. Uh, I will go in. This is our uh, this is our operating team. Uh, two operating theater nurses, one anesthesiologist, one anesthetic nurse, two surgeons, and one scrub nurse. And uh, we define uh, the busy time is the turnover time, not the surgery. So that, that, that's where everybody is around and. Uh, securing a short tur tur turnover time. Our operating procedure is with a linear stapler, anticholic antigastric, and uh, hand suturing of the defect and closing of the mesenterial defects. We think that using the linear stapler, it is both faster and uh, it's faster and cheaper and uh, I think better than using a combination of linear and circular stapler. The anesthesia protocol is very predefined and uh, it does not matter who is doing the anesthesiology, it's done in, uh, in a strict manner and uh, the termination of anesthesia and surgery is approximately at the same time. On average, we have a two minutes uh, gap between extubation and the last stitch in the wound. Uh, in order to uh, secure uh, fast turnover, uh, we have to open up three packages. One kit from the company uh, providing stapler, uh, and we have a, a, as a few surgical instruments as possible uh, in, uh, in, in third of th the third package. And uh, we have the we have standardized procedure, all the surgeons do it in the same way with the same instrument. So the patient is prepared and ready, well informed, and he knows exactly what will happen at the operating theater. No premedication, uh, no anticoagulation before surgery, usually, uh, no solid food for eight hours before surgery, and fluids are allowed to drink in the morning and take a, his regular medic medication and take a shower. And the, the surgeon, one of the surgeon, take the patient with him uh, to the surgery and uh, leave the bed outside the door. And the surgeon uh, strap the patient leg at the operating table. And this is uh, important. We do a parallel, parallel working, not longitudinal working. That means uh, both anesthesia and uh, scrub nurses and, and the OR nurses work with the patient at the same time. We have done many thousands of this and it is a waste of time not doing it this way. In some uh, units, you are not allowed to say a word or touch the patient until the patient is intubated. By that way, you lose at least 15 minutes in every case, and that is a lot of money by time. So everybody work with the patient at the same time and the patient does not uh, experience this as a stressful event. Uh, on the contrary, they, they think it is relaxing to see many, many person uh, taking care of, uh, care of them. Nobody leave the room until the patient is in bed. And the anesthesiologist and surgeon transfer the patient uh, to the recovery room and to bring the next patient in seven minutes later. 
we the first year we rec recorded all the time on different issues this is one of the registration uh, starting of anesthesia and start of surgery usually uh, it's uh, it's now it's only about five minutes and this is important uh, it showed the non-surgical time and now it's only about 12 minutes where we are not operating while the patient is in the operating theater. Gastric bypass take on average about 30, 35 minutes and sleeve about 20 minutes. And the total time is under 45 minutes from one patient uh, extubated until the next is intubated. And uh, the ERAS protocol is important. The patient uh, go to the recovery room and is allowed to drink fluid uh, at once he is awake and uh, is mobilized out of bed into, that, into a chair within an hour and uh, up and going after two hours. We call it walking test where the patient uh, take his uh, bed with the nurse into his room. And uh, the nurses at the ward have to put a big effort at, at the day of surgery and the, the motto is keeping the patient busy. He record his fluid intake, use the pep whistle, and uh, keep the patient active. The next day, we, it's important we, we, give, we hydrate the patient, give them one liter ringer intravenously, and there's a group meeting with a dietitian. And uh, they start with the supplements two weeks after surgery, start with the low molecular heparin, take omeprazole for three months. We have a discharge meeting with the surgeon uh, talking about the possible complication, how to react, uh, remind them on the, on the telephone. They have to call the surgeon at call or the, or the ward if there is some symptoms of complication. This is our ERAS protocol. I'm not going in details here. Uh, at the day of surgery, uh, it's very important if the patient, patient is not following what is expected, out of bed, smiling. If it's, if it's not like that, we take the patient, we, we are not wasting time on uh, CT or uh, some examination. We take the patient down to the surgical theater before the staff leave for the day and we do a real laparoscopy. We uh, almost never regret that. Sometimes you find a little bleeding and we can repeat the leak test. And it's also in our protocol how to treat a complication. We think uh, in, in case of leak, if you suspect leak, we are not wasting time on uh, CT. It's surgery. We look what is, what's going on to take a leak test. And if you have a leak after a gastric bypass, you don't try to shoot through the hole. You just put in a drain and gastrostomy tube and uh, these will heal within in about 10 days the patient is discharged within a week uh, everything else like putting in a putting in stents it's just waste of time and money in our opinion if the patient has a, have a has a leak after sleep we convert it into gastric bypass if you can do the bypass above the leakage hole, it's fine. If you don't, it's also fine. And then you keep the drain and treat it as a leak after bypass. If you have a sign of bowel obstruction after bike bypass, you are uh, vomiting. We put a nasogastric tube and keep the tube there as well as long as you are backing uh, bile. And uh, we have a two uh, two. Uh, this uh, horrible complication with the uh, aspiration uh, during int intubation. So we always push on, put a nasogastric tube. Um, we, as, I, as I said, we have a surgeon at call, but the nurse, nurses at the ward, they call the patient the day after, uh, day after discharge and one week after discharge and the dietitian call the patient two weeks after discharge. Uh, we have a low threshold for readmission. Uh, we have a complication registration. And we have a, this discharge classification. We think it's use, useful because in the weekend, we close. Uh, we do the surgery for four days, and the surgical staff have a call, and they don't have to show up on Fridays. They have a call 
that are cold until four o'clock on Friday. And in the weekend, we have to hire a place in the hospital if we have a problem. And uh, we have the highest case miss, uh, the, 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 the patient that have uh, uh, multiple medical illness, they're taking, uh, we operate them on Monday in the beginning of the week. Uh, and uh, with a severe psychological problem, uh, they're taking in the beginning of the week and the, the EC patient in the end of the week. Employed patient with a lower BMI. And in that way, uh, we are not, we are saving money or not having patient often in the weekends at, at the ward, the hospital. Well, our results is uh, in our team, we have a hospital stay and now it's on 1.3 day. Readmission rate are about 4%, complication rate about 2.5%. And uh, uh, we have a high uh, patient satisfaction rate. And we have been, uh, in, in my team, have had the highest volume and the lowest complication rate in Sweden since our year 2009. And there is a linear correction, uh, correlation between uh, volume of patient and uh, efficiency and the complications. In Sweden, we have the heaviest case mix of patients as well. When we have a certain under, tra under training, we reduce uh, the program uh, one, one surgery. So we have a 7766 patient under the surgeon under training is allowed to operate for 45 minutes in patient number three and number five. And we record all the operation, and, uh, and that is how we learn. If, if there is a complication, uh, the, the, the surgeon has to sit with me and we see is there, is there a technical issue related to this complication. And uh, under training, uh, much of the training is, is, is uh, handling the suture technique, suturing with forehand, forehand and backhand, uh, the gentle touch. Factors that a certain good economy, uh, it's very important that the hospital board and, and, and the team have the same business case, uh, have the same goal, and it's a business case. And in our case, if we do a five cases a, a day, we are not earning anything. Uh, we, we, if we have a complication, like if we have a patient in the intensive care unit for two days, it's the same price we have to pay. It's about 3,000. A British pound each day at the uni, uh, so we have cannot afford uh, uh, poor quality, and uh, it's uh, it's a case number six, seven, and eight that give us earnings. So well organized team, and uh, the discharge classification help to keep the patient out uh, of the ward for the weekend. Uh, we uh, have a surgical procedure without access to use of stapler and uh, use multiple use instrument as uh, much as we can. Short hospital stay and low admission rate and complication rates, certain good economy. 55% uh, of the cost is salaries and the rest, uh, more than a half is uh, the staplers. Incentive for the staff is good atmosphere at work. And uh, people like uh, this uh, busy standardized routine. Surgical team have four weeks at work on the outpatient clinic and the board five days, but uh, they are uh, have, uh, they're not working in the weekend. And uh, they have, uh, they're not working at holidays, uh, usually 10 to 15 extra days a year. And they have a, in, in uh, Christmas, Eastern summer holidays, they are off. We pay them a little bit more and we, uh, they, they have a, the opportunity to, to uh, go on courses on education and uh, the different places. So the conclusion is that uh, obesity surgery can be performed in a safe and efficient uh, way by standardization, doing it simple and having focus on the patient to avoid unnecessary element of treatment, 
predefined clinical pathway. And even after several years of praxis, there is still potential for improvement. So the fast track principle enhances the treatment process, reduce cost, lead to shorter hospital stay and associated with low complication and readmission rates. Thank you. Fantastic. Where, where to start with you, Huchter? <laughs> so thank you very, very much, obviously, for uh, a, a really, really informative, enlightening talk. Um, we've had a few questions through the audience, but um, I've prepped the questions into sort of quick fire uh, questions for you because I want to cover quite a lot. So thanks yeah. for unsharing. And if the audience have any more questions, please post them via the Q&A. OK, so sleep apnea. Yes. Um, you don't test for it. You don't care about it. And it's a waste of time because when patients lose weight, 60% of them will lose their sleep apnea. So a lot of anesthetists are concerned about the effect of anesthesia on the depth of sleep. And when REM sleep returns day four, day five, and yeah. the risk of desaturation post-hospital discharge day four, day five. And that's the big risk behind um, operating on patients with untreated sleep apnea. So how do you manage these patients? How, how do you keep it safe? And how is a BMI 60 patient with severe sleep apnea, how do they get a good outcome in your unit? Well, uh, they do. Well, uh, of course, many of these patients are saturating poorly uh, before surgery. True. And uh, of course, if they are saturating poorly, uh, we are not, uh, it could be an extra day at the hospital, to be honest, but not often. And uh, well, we don't like them to stay on opioids if, if they have a, uh, untreated sleep apnea. So that, that is one of the tasks for an anesthesiologist. But we have get away with it. We have not had a problem uh, with this. So we don't think, well, in, in Oslo, we, the biggest unit for sleep apnea in the country was at the same place. And the, we have tried this and many of these patients, they cannot use the CPAP, we operate them anyway. And uh, well, we have no, had no hazard, uh, no problem uh, in the day four or five uh, with these patients. Okay, that's really reassuring. You know, in a lot of places in the UK, any patient with sleep apnea has to go to HDU post-op. We don't do yeah. that in our center, but that's standard practice. Yeah, um, I know, so I'm aware of that, but- uh, Okay. Well, I think it's overkill. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. Okay, well, that's why I'm, I'm quizzing you and pushing you. We've had a yeah. question from our physiotherapist in Derby. So she's asking, um, uh, let me just bring the question up. So do you have a physiotherapist as part of your team? And do you get any many, po what's your post-op respiratory complication rate? Well, um, I think uh, we have a low, uh, we have a, the surgical time is short. And the uh, early mobilization is is a is a key issue. Yeah. We have a, a respiratory problem is uh, is very rare in our settings. Uh, and I think if you have a if I if you have a huge patient with a, with a three hours of surgical time, it's quite a different case. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we yeah. we don't use elastic stocking. We uh, so the key issue to get the patient up as soon as possible. Okay, yeah. So you don't use TED stockings, you don't use Floatron boots. No. Uh, and I think the key is your efficiency in theatre and the short surgery and anesthesia time. That's the absolute key for the fantastic outcomes that you have. And, the, and this ERAS protocol uh, is yeah, no, important. Yeah. Yeah, it's all, all the components work together. I think yeah. the whistle that you refer to is similar to the spirometry, to incentive yeah, spirometry. Yes, that's yes, right. So the patients use that. Okay. Uh, a query about the group session. So, you, so the pre-op preparation for the patients is within a group done by members of the MDT. Yes. And the post-op day one dietitian review, because uh, I visited your centre, so I remember, is also done in a group session. Do the yeah. patients like that? Most of them like that, and they 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 join group and the Facebook, and the, uh, so um, they help each other. Of once in a while, we have to do it separate separately. They say, "No, I don't want to be part of the group, but this is a private." But yeah. that is very rarely in uh, the Nordic country, at least. Okay, and okay. Uh, we think it's uh, more inspiring to have it in a group, and you get uh, 
well, do saying the same thing uh, for 30, 30 minutes, eight yeah. times a day. Yeah, it's yeah. like no, no, absolutely devastating. Yeah. And it's exactly as you say about working smart and so on. So I'm going to come to the um, to the questions from the audience in a minute. Uh, intraop, your anesthesia protocol. Do you run an opioid free protocol? I didn't have time to look at the slide you showed. Or do you use opioids? Well, we we use opioids. We think it's a good medication, but but we are trying to keep the opioid level low. Yeah. And uh, we are looking at uh, going further in that direction, but the, we don't think it's a goal to have it completely opioid free. Yeah, because a lot of the centers that say, that claim that they do totally opioid free, so it's opioid free in theater, and the minute the patient hits the ward, yeah. the nurses yes. are giving them morphine and completely undoing that. Yeah. Um, how many bariatric trays and liver retractors do you have in your center? Well, um, we have a 10 uh, for each center. And that is one of the time, one of the thing we see in many hospitals, you know, it's a, it's a one time investment. So we have a, a complete kit for 10 operations. So if the autoclave is not working, yeah. you can do the whole day without distressing the, uh, the staff. Yeah, so minimum of 10 and presumably you autoclave on site and it's ready for the next day. Everything that's is ready. Right. That's right. Okay, uh, all right, let's go to some of the questions from the group. So uh, a question from one of the audience members, how do you decide on the operation? Is it the surgeon decision, patient decision, or both? Uh, which surgery? Yeah, which surgery to choose, yeah. Well, well, uh, before surgery, they have to, uh, they have to um, sign a surgical agreement. And in that agreement, uh, most patients agree that we can change surgery during surgery. So yeah. uh, for example, sleeve, I don't like sleeve if there is a hiatus hernia. Yeah. So we are more or less, uh, because uh, some of these patients will get problem later yeah. with dysphagia yeah. and reflux. So so uh, if it's a real here hiatus hernia, we, we change it to a bypass. Of course, if there is a malrotation, we don't like bypass or a lot of adhesion. So, 90% 90, 90 of the patients, they agree, uh, consent that we can change surgery when we see how this uh, looks like inside. Okay, so it's so good you mentioned hiatus hernia, because that was a question of mine. So you've mentioned big hiatus hernia. How big, what's your size limit for offering bariatric surgery? Uh, you do, uh, with a hiatal, hiatal hernia. Yeah, well, in, terms, in terms of a simultaneous hiatal hernia repair. Yeah, well, we, 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 in a, in a, if it's a sleeve, of course, you don't do a sleeve in a hiatus hernia. If it is a bypass, we, we are doing, a, although um, most of the stomach is in the torus, then we are doing bypass. But if you do a bypass, we, you have to mobilize the bypass stomach and do a kind of two pair. So mm. you take the fundus and you, you try to adapt the crura. Uh, post, uh, posteriorly, and then you suture to the, the uh, fundus to the left and to the right crura, and you use the bypass stomach as a pad to prevent paraesophageal herniation. Okay, okay. Um, I, I'm doing my best to try to get through all these questions quickly, but there's so many that are coming through, I'm struggling to keep up. Okay, so very, very quickly, quick fire, revisional surgery slots, hospitalization and follow-up. So uh, I think 15% of your 15-20% um, revisional rate. Yeah. So do you allow more time in theatre? Does it cost more for the hospital? And how do you plan? So for example, if you've got a revision, does that count as two slots in terms of primary surgery? Or how do you do it? Uh, like, uh, it depends on if it was, a, we have a lot of open VPGs. Uh -huh. and, uh, and there is an artesian there. So two VPDs, these is thri three primary. Yeah. And, uh, and there, are, uh, there are only me and one other surgeon in the team that is allowed to do this revision. Yeah. So my first ever VBG, open VBG converted laparoscopically to ruin why bypass took me seven hours in Derby. Seven hours in theater. Yeah. Well, <laughs> so we, 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 are, we are taking shortcut. We, well, of course, this patient has to do a gastroscopy before. Yeah, and yeah. if they are not obese, we take the band. But uh, usually we just uh, put an anastomosis more or less at the, at the esophagus. We go above. 
Okay, a question here about uh, one anastomosis gastric bypass. So both yeah. I and audience member noticed you didn't mention it at all, in, or you don't no. do it. What's your view I, on it? I don't like it. Why? Because um, there is a better alternative that is called SASI. Uh, well, through the year I have had a lot of reoperation, re converting a ru as one anastomosis to ruin white gastric bypass. Mm. They have a problem with chronic ulcers, with bleeding and perforation that can come, can come several up to 10, 15 years after surgery. Mm. And uh, well, um, I, I think uh, if you if you are I think SASI is much more uh, sensible than, than one anastomosis bypass, because if you do a SASI, you are not uh, cutting the stomach. You are not, because uh, when you do the, uh, do the mini bypass, you have a poor circulation because gastric and extra flow, blood flow circulation is not that anastomosis. And uh, uh, I don't see, uh, by, by SASI, you also have a much more stable anastomosis by anti-reflux, uh, anti-rotation suturing. So, okay. yeah. So, yeah. Uh, well, in my opinion, uh, mini bypass is uh, is not a good procedure. Okay. And uh, you have a lot of reflux problem with the mini bypass as well. You do, you do. No, no, I appreciate your honesty there and uh, just telling it as it is. Uh, now, we've had a question from a bariatric nurse down south. Um, yeah. What's your combination analgesia protocol uh, on the ward? We've had the intra op. So, what do, you, what do you give on the ward? Codeine, tramadol, morphine, or a morph, subcut well, morphine? Uh, what do you do? Well, th this is a complex uh, protocol. Uh, our main pro, main uh, medication is of course of course paracetamol, one one gram time four. Uh -huh. They get the uh, arcoxia or dynastat as well. And uh, so well, the first uh, the first hour we, uh, of course I have to admit the first hour on average they get um, about uh, oxynorm about uh, 10, 15 milligram first two hours. Okay. Um, more questions coming, but we're almost running out of time. So just bear with me, Hufta. Now, I had a big, big question for you about incentivization of theatre staff. Okay. So, so how do you get the theatre staff to believe in what you believe in, in doing high volume? Because at the end of the day, they get paid X amount for turning up to work, regardless of how many cases they do. So how do you change that to making them want to do high volume cases like what you do? Because you earn from high well, volume. Uh, so yeah. how, what do you do for yeah. the staff to? Well, well we, we pay them a little bit extra. Uh -huh. And they get, uh, like, uh, they get the extra day off due, during the year, definitely. And they are, have, they are not working in the weekend. On Friday, they don't have to show up. Okay. So, and we, uh, when we have a lot of courses uh, with, uh, before with Johnson Johnson, now with Metronic, and the, and the money we get for these courses is, is to uh, send and to educate the, the rest of the staff, not the doctors. Fantastic. Absolutely. So, uh, so we try to keep, uh, well, uh, to be honest, I, our staff are not. Uh, we have a very stable staff. They like they like the efficiency. You're the one who employs them. They're not employed by the hospital. You employ them well, yourself. Now, now it's it's a GP obesity. Like um, that's yeah. a that's a firm uh, owned by the physicians. Okay, quick question from Nick uh, Reynolds, who's uh, one of our anaesthetists in Derby. What insufflation pressures do you use? 12, we use, 12 or 15 or 20? No. Uh, we use 18. 18. Yeah. But, uh, you know, in, in, in our sleeves, uh, we, uh, we, we don't give you any muscle relaxants usually. And uh, in a minute, you don't give muscle relaxants for the sleeves. No, not for easy sleeves. Wow. Easy, I mean, BM under 50. And, uh, and, uh, uh, well, we have done a random study on uh, on uh, on uh, on uh, uh, unpublished in obesity surgery uh, pressure eighteen versus pressure twelve, hmm. and we did not find any difference in cause of pain and and nausea or tiredness or medication. The only difference was 
it was uh, we had a quicker surgical time with a higher higher volume. But of course, we cooperate with the anesthesia. They often ask us to uh, take the pressure down to 14 or 12, and uh, we do that, of course. The key thing, Hurta, is you're quick. So a 20-minute operation at a pressure of 18, you, you'll never pick up a difference compared to a pressure of 15 or 12. That's so right. it's the That's speed right. and efficiency uh, yeah. that you have in the team. Mm. And of course, if, if you are operating a patient with a, uh, with a, where you have to operate a big hiatus hernia, you have to push the, put the pressure down to 12 because otherwise you get the emphysema at the, at the neck and the face. And the, Okay. Um, another question. Um, why aren't you sending the patients as a day case home on the same day? You've, well, got, we you've, did got, that. The, you've got the data, you're quick. So what's your view? Yeah, yeah, we, we, we did that in, in orders and we did, uh, did uh, but it, well, it, it's feasible, but that was not sensible because it was very stressful for us, you know. Um, so we think it's uh, easier to just keep them until the next day. But of course, you can do it as a daycare surgery. Uh, they can go at the hotel next to the hospital. We have discussed that. But, uh, well, we like, uh, we think that it's, a, it's a, the, the patient care and the, have the discharge and see the patient uh, in a group day after. Uh, it's 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 better. You sleep better. as well. You sleep better. You yourself, as I said. Yeah, yeah, that's that, definitely. Okay, good. Um, um, we had a question about the the very sick patients with organ failure. So, in terms yeah. of your patient selection, do you still do them in your hospital, or do you send them elsewhere? Who do you, who do you turn away for surgery? Who do you say no to? Well, we are really not turning many patients away, and the, 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 the things are changing. Well, uh, our, our, the endocrinologists, the cardiologists are our, our friends, even the psychiatrists are our friends, mm -hmm. and that was not like that some years ago. Mm -hmm. So we, we, we have very hardly turned anybody away. Of course, uh, the calculated risk has to be acceptable. Okay. And uh, these patients are taking up, uh, they are not fast track patients, these patients when we do them. So let me let me recap a few of the numbers uh, for those who missed the start of the talk. So you literally have five minutes between the start of anesthesia and surgery beginning. OK, so that's your yes. time. 45 minutes in general between from one patient to another. To the next. Yes. So the whole procedure, the anesthesia, the theater turnaround, it's 45 minutes. That's your unit. Uh, your typical bypass is 35 minutes, your typical sleeve is 20 minutes. And one of the key things you do if a patient is not progressing on the ward, you don't bother with a CT, you take them back and you do a real laparoscopy. So what's your negative real laparoscopy rate? Well, um, when, when, you do, when you do a real lap, uh, well, I think one, one fourth of the patients are completely negative. Ah. Oh, wow. Uh, of the of the real laparoscopy is uh, one fourth, but uh, then you when you have done the laparoscopy, take you 10, 15 minutes. It's yeah. much easier to handle the patient afterwards in the ward, and uh, because you know there is nothing there, and uh, well we we never regret this. You know if you do a CT, it does not help you. Negative CT does doesn't tell you anything. Very very true. Very true. Okay. Uh, I think I think I've asked you and grilled you enough. <laughs> so thank you ever so much for a really, really educational and absolutely first class talk. I'm really, really happy that you agreed to share your experience with us. Uh, I would encourage anybody who's watching this, please, if you're able to take your bariatric team to visit Hurta. Uh, yes. and visit his you're day. welcome. We will have um... Yeah, Take very good care of you. Uh, so I think after the to... in March, March we will start the courses on full scale. Good. So March twenty two, and Hurta is now based in um, Sweden, and yeah. you're working with two companies, two well known companies that do staplers, and they are supporting yeah. the educational visits 
to your center. So, uh, I mean, we learned a huge amount in Derby and it helped us transform our service, uh, but still we're nowhere near what you're doing. So thank you very much and good luck in GB uh, Obesitas. It sounds a fantastic company uh, and I'm sure uh, you'll go really far, okay? So thank you again, Hurta, uh, and thank, thank you to the audience and questions to Novo for sponsoring and we'll see you guys in a couple of weeks. Good night, thank you very, very much. It's a pleasure, thank you.